In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one essence with the Father, through him all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became human, and was crucified for us unto Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried, and rose on the third day according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who spoke through the prophets, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I expect the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. Amen. Take a seat. So last, last week, um, beginning with the Divine Liturgy, uh, we spoke about the words which open the, for us the Divine Liturgy. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so for us, just that sentence alone is an entire revelation. It's a revelation of God's kingdom to us and that God's kingdom for us is or encompasses the entire Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, whom we believe as one true God and we worship as God. But also, apart from that, the priest continues and says, now and, to, and now and forever and to the ages of ages. In other words, that God's kingdom is eternal. We also said, apart from that, proclaiming those words, that at that moment, mystically, what happens is heaven and earth unite and become one. So for the time that we're in the divine liturgy, we are in the presence of God's kingdom, of the Trinitarian God's kingdom, that eternal kingdom which we long for. So for us, the way that we understand it, we believe it, and more so we experience, is that we begin to experience God's kingdom from here, and that's found in the divine liturgy. And so when that verse finishes, the faithful then or the chanters on behalf of the faithful then proclaim Amen. That word Amen, which we know is a Hebrew word, for us is like a thunderbolt. It's a very powerful word, and it's a word that we should all be able to proclaim, which means this is the way that it is, okay? And I am in full agreement with this. That's why we say Amen. And so basically that we believe everything that the priest has just proclaimed that we have entered into the kingdom of heaven and we are now united with everything which is divine and holy and we will see later on in the in um, the divine liturgy what it means to be holy and that we are in agreement with that and therefore that's why we say amen and so from after the pri priest's opens the divine liturgy by saying those words then he begins to say petitions and remember what we we said last week last week we said and we're reminded in the divine liturgy that from that moment onwards everything changes mystically not just externally and not just um and and not just uh um what can i say not just in a symbolic way, thank you, not in a symbolic way, but in a very mystical way and internally as well. And at that moment, because we're in the very presence of God, then we become saints. We become holy. We become one with all those who are holy, and the one who is holy is God himself. We say that in the divine liturgy. We say one is holy, 
One is Lord Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. Amen. But before we say that, which is just before we close the royal doors, we say, the priest says, let us attend the holy gifts for the holy ones of God. Okay? Proskomen daia tisagis. The holy gifts for the holy ones of God. Who are the holy ones of God? Us. And if you see, see even in the holy scriptures, the early Christians always would refer to each other as saints. St. Paul says, greet the saints of the church in Corinth. Greet the saints of the church in Ephesus, in Galatia. The Christians always refer to as saints. Now, today, we don't refer to each other as saints. But saints, the word saint is the Latin word, which means, um, which in Latin is sanctus, which means holy. And again in Greek, agios, iagi, okay, means the same thing, agi, uh, which mean, means holy. Saint and agios means holy. And we say the holy gift, which is the body and blood of Christ on the altar table at that time, and when the priest says that, he lifts up the, um, he's lifting up the lamb, is offered to the holy ones of God. In other words, those who are present here in this divine service, who have become sanctified through this divine service. Today, as I said, we don't call each other saints, the saints of the church of St. Albans, although it's not wrong to say, okay? Because we are on this path to holiness. This is, um, this is, uh, our in, uh, the, the very um, being okay, of our existence, the reason for our existence, to become holy. And although we don't feel it, and al although maybe we're very far from it, by being in here in the sacrament, this is how we become sanctified. And so um, we understand this even from the reverence that we show not only towards the people that are in the sacrament of the mystery of the liturgy, but even to artifacts that, you, that are used in the, in, in the liturgy. As I said, the, the, I mean, the obvious ones are the, the chalice and the disc that we use, the Holy Gospel um, and the um, andimintia that we use in the altar table. All of those things become sanctified. The priest's vestments, and why do they become sanctified? Um, simply because they've been sanctified in the divine liturgy. And these are just objects. When we clean the church, things that are used for the church, even the dust, the rubbish, because it's been in the divine liturgy, we don't just dispose of it. We put it somewhere in the garden because it's considered as holy. So if objects are considered as holy, imagine how much so we who are in the, not only in the presence of God in the divine liturgy, but who partake and participate in the body and blood of Christ. Um, today, just for, um, for fact's sake, uh, the word agios, you know how the ancient, uh, the early Christians would call themselves holy, saints, uh, is still uh, referred to uh, bishops still use that terminology. So, for example, uh, if a bishop was speaking to um, Archbishop Macarius of Australia, and the, uh, and the Archbishop of Greece was speaking with the Archbishop Macarius of Australia, he would say, Aige Australias, okay? And Archbishop Macarius would say, Aige Elados, okay? Saint Australia, Saint Greece, okay? If we're going to translate it like that. It's still kept amongst um, the hierarchy in the church today. And the reason why I'm saying this um, uh, from, the, uh, from the sentence that we said, blessed is the kingdom, is that because now we are in the presence of the kingdom, the very first thing that we begin to do after we've acknowledged um, the Holy Trinity and that we're in his kingdom and with, we've bowed with reverence at that point, then we begin these petitions. And this is called the Liturgy of the Catechumens. These petitions, which are requests to God. 
And the first three have to do with peace. It says, in, we, know, we know them, in peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. And for the peace of the whole world, for the stability of the holy churches of God, and for the union of all, let us pray to the Lord. So the first three petitions that we say, straight after blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, are petitions asking God to grant us peace. Now this peace that we ask God to grant us is very different from the peace that the world would understand. World peace, okay? No wars, no violence, um, no destruction, whether it's physical destruction or mental destruction. That's not the type of peace that we're praying for in this instance. Even though, of course, the, um, the church prays uh, for that type of peace as well. Of course, the church doesn't want wars. It doesn't want um, violence and any type of other destructions. But the peace here that we're asking for is for God's peace. The peace that the angels chanted um, with uh, when Christ was born and they began to sing and glorify God, saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to all people. You see, Christ has come, we say, as the King of Peace. Yet at the same time, Christ tells us, I have not come to bring peace into the world, but the sword. A mother shall go against her daughter, a father against her son, a mother-in-law against her her daughter-in-law. And so it seems as though here, there's a contradiction with what Christ himself is saying. That Christ hasn't come to bring peace to the world and that with him there's violence. But that's not true. You see, the peace that Christ gives us is different to the peace that he's referring to when he says, I have not come to bring peace in the world. The peace that Christ is referring to there is the peace that we usually say we want to live a peaceful life without any destruction, violence, um, and without any anger or anything else. Okay? That's the type of peace that Christ is referring to. And the reason why he says this is because he knows very well that because of his namesake, people will be persecuted. People will be attacked. There will be not only a spiritual attack from the devil, but there will also be physical attacks against people, and more specifically against Christians. And so he warns Christians and he tells them from the very beginning, don't be scandalized, don't be afraid, and don't even think about what you're going to say. He says, if they hated me, they will hate you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So he tells us of all these things. He also says that a time will come that you'll be killed for my name's sake and people will be thinking that they will be doing service to God. But at the same time that he says this, he also says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. In other words, be glad and he he says the same thing as well something very similar in the beatitudes blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake be glad he says and rejoice for yours is the kingdom of heaven okay so more accurately your reward will be great in heaven for those who are persecuted for my name's sake. So we know now that when we make that conscious decision to follow Christ, things will be anything but peaceful. Anything but peaceful in our lives. Um, 
there, there will be many difficulties. People will turn against us even from our own household. A perfect example. On Monday, we're going to start Lent. And a lot of people, and I've noticed that in most houses, it's only probably one or two people the most that will start fasting. And then because they want to start fasting, then there's always some um, sort of, let's say, attack from other family members. Why are you fasting? Why aren't you eating? Why do you do what the church tells you to do? Where does Christ say in the Bible to fast? You're going to make yourself sick. You need to eat. All 140,000 excuses. Why? Simply because we've chosen, to put it in very simple terms, to change our diet okay, for a number of days. But the reason, but because we've chosen to do this for spiritual reasons, then we have this type of attack. From, and that's just, that's, just, that's just when it comes to fasting. Um, then we know that there's other attacks as well, because we've chosen to follow Christ. Because we've chosen not to walk with the world, but to walk against the current. Okay? And there's difficulties all the time. And it seems as though, and I'm sure that all of you can relate, the more we try, the more obstacles, some, uh, the more obstacles come in our way. The moment that we say, okay, from now on, I'm going to apply myself even more. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to start going to church. Then all of the sudden, all of the sudden, there's these temptations that we never imagined would happen. I don't know. An old friend all of a sudden um, calls us out of nowhere and wants to catch up with us on Sunday morning, for example. You know, um, you've finally been able to get over um, being addicted to something on Facebook, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you discover Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> And you get addicted to that. Okay. So always there's something that will try to disturb the peace that we're trying to find with God. And that's why Christ says that I have not come to bring peace but a sword. There's always something that's trying to distance ourselves from God. But on the contrary, at the same time, Regardless of all of that, regardless of whatever abuse we may find in front of us, whether it's from someone um, physical or whether it's something demonic from the devil, regardless of all of that, there's a different type of peace that Christ speaks about and that we pray for in the divine liturgy. We say for the peace from above. So even though we know and we expect that everything will be rattled in our world from that perspective, there's something inside us that will remain unshaken. And that's the peace that comes from God. And we ask for that peace to come not only on us, but on the churches, Okay, so the entire church and on the entire world. For us to be filled with this type of peace. And anyone who will or may have experienced that will understand that we're going through something very difficult. That we're, that we're facing this huge temptation. And it it's, feels as if our life is being shattered. But then we run to Christ, we run to prayer, we run to the sources that the church has given us, that Christ has given us, whether it's the Holy Scriptures, whether it's the Psalms, whether it's prayers um, to the Mother of God or certain saints, and whether it's the sacraments, the Divine Liturgy, the Sacrament of Confession, the Sacrament of Holy Unction. We run to those means and we begin to experience something which settles within our heart. And that 
is much more powerful than the things that which we seem to be shaking the foundations of our world. And it's um, and so, so powerful to the point that we begin to glorify and to thank God for the temptation that we're going through. And we're saying, thank you, God. Because if it wasn't for this difficulty, if it wasn't for this, um, t this temptation, if it wasn't for this obstacle, if it wasn't for this type of persecution, then I wouldn't be able to experience this peace that you're offering me right now. This reassurance that al although I feel as though things are falling apart in my soul, in my mind, in the world around me, I know that you are there and I can experience the taste of that within me right now and it gives me the strength to continue to go, to, to, to journey in my spiritual struggle. And if we never, and if we don't experience this type of peace, then it would be very, very easy for us to let go of our, of our Christian struggle. I don't think any Christian will be able to endure temptations if they did not experience this peace from God. Hence why we conclude the petitions, and I'm skipping a few now just to go to um, an important part, which says, help us, save us, have mercy on us, O God, by your grace. And we hear that sentence being said continuously throughout all the services, all the services, not just the divine liturgy. We hear that sentence all the time repeatedly. Help us, save us, have mercy on us and protect us, O God, by your grace. The grace of God, which for us is a shield, it overshadows us and it protects us from any temptation that is to come. But we must be careful. And what we don't do is we don't go running to temptations. We don't feel, or let's say, we don't play the part of the hero and say, I'm going to do this and God will, will help me. We don't put the Lord our God as we say to, um, to the test. That's why we say in the Our Father, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So what we're saying to God when we say that part, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, is that although I know that temptations will come, I know that I will be tempted, don't allow me to be the one who runs to that temptation. Lead me away from that temptation. And then whatever you allow to come in my way, deliver me from the evil one, from falling into the, into the traps of that temptation. So that's what we mean when we pray for the peace of God. The peace of God, as I said, doesn't mean that, that the wars will stop. It doesn't mean that people won't be getting killed. It doesn't mean that worldly atrocities won't happen. They will continue to happen. And that will happen until the end of the age. Until God um, renews the whole of creation. Remember, there will be a time when this world will come to an end. Or at least the way that we know this world. Just as we come to an end, but even though we are eternal, so will this world. And the reason why this world must come to an end is that so sin can cease. So that these atrocities and these things which man has brought because of its fallen state will come to an end. And out of God's mercy, not only will he, um, will he stop this not only will he bring an end to all of this but he will renew all of creation so the world in a sense as the holy fathers say 
won't be destroyed. He won't get rid of the world. That won't be destroyed. Because everything that God has created, He has created to be eternal. Okay? Whether it be us as humans, or whether it be the world and the universe, that is all eternal. But when Christ comes in His glory at the second coming, as we know from the scriptures and the Holy Fathers, then everything will be renewed. There will be the resurrection of the dead. So even though we die, our body faces its, the corruption and death, even though the body goes back to the earth and dis disintegrates into the earth and becomes dust and nothing, that body will once again resurrect in its perfected state. It will be once again restored to the way that God intended it to be before the fall of man. And that body will be reunited with the soul. And the entire creation will be renewed. And there will be no more corruption the way that we see it and the way that we understand it in the world at Christ after Christ's second coming. So everything that God created, as I said, is eternal. And so in order to have a, a foretaste or an understanding of what this eternity means, then we must enter into the presence and the peace and the grace of God. Hence why the first three petitions um, refer to God's peace. Having said these things, was there anything that you wanted to say or ask regarding that? So, after that, we have the petition for this holy house and those who enter with faith, reverence and fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. Actually, before we go into that petition, I just wanted to say and explain to you that after every petition, so after the um, blessed is the kingdom, we say Amen, as I said, the response is Amen. After every petition, the response is, Lord, have mercy. So the Christians always respond with the response, Lord, have mercy. When we, went, when we want God to act, we are asking with boldness before God, okay? In other words, with some sort of courage, but at the same time, acknowledging our weakness and our sinful state, although we're daring to, to ask God something, we recognize our weakful and sinful state. Hence why we ask for his mercy and we say, Lord, have mercy. And for us, we know that to be a very powerful prayer. And that's used all the time. That's a very abbreviated version, basically, of the prayer that the fathers have taught us to say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So whether we say the longer version like I just said, or the abbreviated version, Lord have mercy, it means exactly the same thing. We're calling upon the name of God as Lord, and we're asking for His mercy. To be merciful to us in our sinful and wretched state, and to give us his peace, to be merciful to, to us and to bless us and the house that, that we're in, the temple that we're in. Okay? In the early church, the beautiful thing about this Lord have mercy was, you see, everyone has a place in, in the church, right? Um, and there's something for everyone. The Lord have mercies were actually reserved to be said by the children in church. Today, how many children are there that are there at the petitions? Not many, okay? But in the early church, it was the children that used to say, Lord, have mercy. And to be specific, their spot in the church was at the very front. Today, we try to put our children somewhere 
um, as far away as possible from the front of the church. Why? Because maybe they make noise, because they're distracting, um, we're embarrassed you know, of others. But there was always a structure in the church. The female children here on the left side, the male children here on the right side, and then the adults behind them, females on the left, males on the right. Okay? And this was a practice up until very recently. I remember my grandparents telling me that this was the way it was in the church. Children were always at the front of the church. They were able to see. They were able to participate. They were able to say the responses to the petitions. But we have manuscripts as far as the first centuries of the church, the third and um, fourth centuries of the church, where it was the children's role to say, the Lord have mercy. We have um, a nun, a Spanish nun from the third century. Her name was Egeria, or Etheria. And we have a manuscript from, of, her, of her pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land. And there she would go through all the feasts and what they were doing there, in the, what, how they practiced and celebrated the feasts in the Holy Land. And I can't remember which day of the week it was of Holy Week. Um, in one of her manus manuscripts, she says that the bishops would be reading the names of the pilgrims um, at, at the Holy Land. And after each name, the children were saying, Lord, have mercy. So it would say, Ioannis, and the children would say, Lord, have mercy. Maria, Lord, have mercy. Paraskevi, Lord, have mercy. The children will be responding as, Lord, have mercy. And unfortunately, that's something which we've lost these days. And we don't even recognize, for example, the significance of how old uh, the practice is of actually reading names. Now we had Soul Saturday on Saturday. And for, um, for 40 minutes to an hour, I, I don't know, depending on the parish that you go to, the priest is there doing memorials for the departed and he's reading names, name after name. And so what do we do when the priest is reading names? I know I've diverted a little bit, but one thing brings the other. What do we do when the priest is reading names? Most of us are sitting in our seat, yawning, looking at our time, waiting how long or timing how long the priest is going to take to read the names, as if it's some sort of race or competition. Um, sometimes us priests get together as well. How long were you reading names? <laughs> okay. But, and then some are just waiting to hear their names. They're waiting. They're waiting to hear their names. Um, and if for whatever reason they don't hear their names because we've read 50,000 million names, um, they get upset because we didn't hear their, they didn't hear their names. But just a word of, a word, of, word of advice, something that we can take away from all of this. That when we are at services like that, and the priest is reading names, it's not a break for you. It certainly isn't for the priest, okay? But it shouldn't be for you either. You're in the presence there of that service, of that sacrament, whatever it is, whether it's the divine liturgy, whether we're reading names at the Holy Unction, or whether we're reading names um, for memorials, or ayasmo, or paraclesis. The faithful can sit there and mystically inside them be saying, Lord, have mercy. So that way, everyone can participate on praying for, um, on behalf of the person who is being commemorated. So, one of the most powerful forms of prayer is not just praying for ourselves. A lot of the times, we have um, the bad habit of just praying for ourselves. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, protect me. Or if it's not going to be ourselves, it might be just our children, our spouses, our parents, our immediate family. But what the church does when it's here all together 
It prays for everyone, for the entire world, and everyone participates in that. So, rather than letting your mind wander, next time you're in a service like that, prayerfully, as you're sitting down there on your seat, say inside you, Lord, have mercy on them. For their name to be written and to be given to the priest, there's a reason. There's a, and there's a different reason for every name that's given. And, um, and we don't know how much our prayers for others can really, really benefit. Um, and I'm saying that from experience. Uh, okay. So we say, yes. Yes, the same thing on a Sunday when we're doing a trisayo or a memorial and reading names. Um, yeah, to be able to say, Lord, have mercy for them. Yeah. And, the, and that's why we do have as well, for example, when we've got Golivan and we distribute the Golivan, the faith will take the Golivan. I'm sure that a lot of, your, a lot of you've, you may have heard a lot of the older people um, which is a beautiful practice that everyone should do. When they take the kolivam, they say, O Theosikoresitus, may God rest their souls, may God forgive their sins, actually, that's what they're saying. May God forgive them, forgive the departed. So we're constantly remembering and praying for everyone, whether departed or living. You're just scratching, huh? Not putting your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what are you? So for this holy house, and those who enter with faith, reverence, and fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. Now, this holy house is for us the temple, um, the church building, let's say. Now, the church building, is, as we've said, is important, but it's not as important as what's in the building or who is in the building. So we know that these buildings come and go. Today they could be in our hands. Tomorrow they could be in, in someone, else's, someone else's hands and do whatever they want to them. Okay? And we as um, Christians from the East, as Orthodox Christians, know this very well. We've lived this, whether it be in Asia Minor, Turkey, um, and we've seen our churches, and even the greatest of churches, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, being built with all its glory and its splendor, being used for so many divine liturgies by saints, by St. John Chrysostom, who liturgized in that church, St. Gregory the Theologian, and so many other saints, by holy emperors like St. Constantine the Great. All of those people worshipped in that temple, but today it's in the hands of of Muslims okay and so that doesn't mean that we can no longer worship just because Hagia Sophia is no longer ours for the Jews it was different for the Jews once the temple was lost for them in 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 the temple of Solomon was lost from then on they were never able to perform sacrifices and that's why the Jews are still waiting for their Messiah to come to rebuild their temple so that they can continue their sacrifices. For us, the, um, the house of God is where the Eucharist is being celebrated. And that's what's important. Regardless of its, if it's a big adorned church, regardless of if it's a makeshift um, shed out in Madagascar and Africa um, and that's where the, the Christians gather to pray it's the house of God because the Eucharist is being celebrated there okay for us what's important is for those who enter it with faith with reverence and with fear of God so anyone who comes into this holy temple with faith in you, with reverence to your name, 
and with fear of your name, that they may be sanctified. And we pray for them. And for us, the house of God, in other words, the place where the sacrifice is happening, St. Maximus the Confessor tells us, is like the unity of the soul and of the body. Okay? Just like we have a body, and that body is united with the soul, so is the house of God. The house of God is the soul of the faithful, and the body of God is us, are those who were gathered there. So every time someone comes to the house of God for the divine liturgy, then there they are being united with their soul. They are filling their soul, but from a spiritual perspective, with God, basically. This is what St. Maximus the Confessor tells us. This is why we need the sacrament of the Eucharist. This is why we need the sacraments in general. Because what it does is it, it reunites us with our soul. Our soul which we know is eternal and God is eternal. And so that's why we come with reverence. That's why we've come with fear of God. And fear of God, let me just tell you that this fear of God that we say, um, some people don't like to say that this fear means afraid of God. But that's part of it as well. Okay, Even in the Old Testament, um, in the book of the, the Wisdom of Solomon, Solomon says the beginning of wisdom is the, is the fear of God. And that's something that is part of our spiritual journey. That yes, to a certain point, we do fear God. And especially at the beginning of our spiritual life, there is a fear of our God. And the, and the fear comes from not God, but from our sins. Because we still have sins in us, we fear the punishment of God. Or what we think the punishment of God means to us. We still can't um, communicate with God um, with boldness, with courage. And that's very real. That's very real for all of us. But we also know that this fear is also a fear that we are afraid that we are going to lose that grace of God that we experience and taste. So once we've overcome this fear of God, of God sitting up there on a cloud with thunderbolts ready to strike us down every time we sin, because that helps us as well in repentance to know that yet yeah, God will also judge us. Once we overcome that through the cleansing of our soul, then this fear starts to become a love. And St. Paul says this in the epistles as well. I no longer fear God, but I love him. And St. Anthony the Great says exactly the same thing. Because he says perfect love casts out fear. So the more we begin to grow in love with Christ, we stop fearing him. But then this other fear comes. This fear of not wanting to be separated from that love of Christ. This fear that because we know that we are weak and we are subject to sins because of our weaknesses, we don't want the grace of God to be distanced from us. And so this is why we try as much as we can to preserve ourselves in purity. Not just physical purity, but mental purity and spiritual purity as well. That's what purity means. That's what virginity means in um, the Orthodox understanding. Okay. If we can say, for example, that someone like St. Mary of Egypt regained her virginity, 
okay? What we're saying is that this person attained the purity of her senses, of her physical senses, of her mental senses, and the senses of her spirit. And all of that were purified once again through the grace of God. So then she no longer needs to fear God's punishment. Okay. But what we do then fear is that our weakness and falling again into our sins. And that fear helps us keep us stronger in our faith. But to accompany that fear, we need to have faith. And faith in what? Not just faith in the Trinity, but faith that God listens to us. God is our Father. That God is merciful. Okay? And that we have been forgiven through our personal repentance. And reverence. That we know that where we are treading is holy ground. Okay? We are in the presence now of the Almighty. We are in the presence of God's divinity. Hence why, if you remember, Moses was asked by God when he was on Mount Sinai to take off his sandals. He says, take your sandals off for the ground which you walk on is holy ground. And so that was an act of reverence. Okay? And so knowing that where we are is holy space and at this moment god is communicating with us not just us communicating to him but he is communicating with us and for us it brings us to reverence because it's the most humbling thing that this god who is so majestic can come down to our low state and commune with me and with you and with everyone else that desires to commune with God. Okay. That's why reverence is so important, especially when we're in worship. Um, uh, and the way that we worship, the way that we control our um, bodily movements, um, our mind, all of these things to be um, reverent. What oh, else? Anything? Any questions? Yes. This is a com connection, what happens here to where we're at home? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, but I understand what you mean. So, um, when you're at home, uh, how does that connect with here? The, um, the divine liturgy for us, or that mystical experience of the Divine Liturgy, doesn't end at, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. We are asked then to take that out to our everyday lives, to our homes and to our workplaces. And that's why St. John Chrysostom says that the Divine Liturgy transforms someone. They come in a lion and they leave a sheep. They come in wild and they leave tame. But we, as much as we can, speaking again about the fear of God, try to maintain this tameness, this peacefulness that we've received from God. And that's how we continually cultivate that communion with God. Not just here but in our everyday life and in all, in all our deeds and works, everything that we do. It, it's an extension of the divine liturgy. We come here, we gather what we need, all the essentials, we're armoured, we're armed, I should say, sorry, by the divine liturgy, and then we go out there and continue the work which we started here. Yeah.
Any other questions? Panayoti. The transgender flag, when you see transgender flags at Coles, do I think that these things will pass? Uh, of course they will pass. God told us that they will. That all, the, all of these things will come to an end. Ne. Um, otherwise, otherwise, if it didn't come to an end, there would be no, none of that peace um, that we spoke about today that we can have you know that famous quote and I've seen that on social media a lot as well where Saint Paisio says what I see around me will drive me insane if I did not know that God had the last word okay thanks anything else yeah Leave it at that. Ne. Mm. Mm. Okay, as of Monday, what can we? Mm -hmm. So as of as of Monday, we start Lent. Uh, what can we and what can't we eat? Okay. So this week we stopped eating meat, right? But we were allowed to eat including tomorrow, even if it's Friday, we're allowed to eat dairy products still. We're allowed to eat fish um, and eggs. We still can have all these things, except meat. As from Monday, which we know as Clean Monday, we begin the Lenten fast, which is the strictest of all the fasts. So I'm going to tell you what is given to us by the church. Now, at the same time, the church also understands and reminds people, okay, this is what we give to you, but everyone needs to do what they are capable of doing. Okay, so because it's the strict of, strictest of fasts, usually from Monday to Friday, on all weeks of Lent, including Holy Week, it's a vegan fast where we don't have dairy, milk, dairy, milk, dairy, eggs, fish, meat, all these things, okay? Nothing which comes from animal. Now, from Monday to Friday, for those who are going to follow the strict fast, that includes oil as well. So people usually have dried or boiled food, okay, during Lent. Um, so there's a lot of fakir going around, fasolava, um, boiled broccolis, whatever you can. Um, and bread, so rice, things like that. For those who follow the fast um, and they, they feel like they, have the, the strict, they can do the strict fast. On the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, the church relaxes the fast and allows people to have oil. So we are allowed, we don't fast on any weekend throughout the year, not just during Lent. We never fast from oil. The only Saturday of the year where we fast from oil is... Sorry? Megalosavato, Holy Saturday. So according to the church calendar, the only Saturday of the year that we ever fast from oil is Holy Saturday, the day before Pascha. So every other Saturday and Sunday of the year, including Lent, we are allowed to have oil. On the, and on certain feast days, we can have oil. And you can check your calendars as well. Like, for example, on the, um, on the 11th of March, which is the feast day of the 40. Um, martyrs, 
we can have um, we have oil. I think it falls during the week. On the feast day of the Annunciation of the Theotokos and on Palm Sunday, we're allowed to have fish. The church allows us to consume fish that day. But every other day of the um, every other day, uh, as I said, is a strict fast for those who can keep that, that type of fast. And it's good um, to maybe run things by with your spiritual father um, on how you want um, to fast and, and, what, and what you can do. Um, because everyone's, as, as I said, everyone's strength is um, different. On, the, um, on Clean Monday, up until um, Clean Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have what we call the three-day fast. Now, the three-day fast, um, for those that can do it, uh, people, uh, it, they are full fast, basically. You don't eat anything. You don't eat or drink anything for three days until after you've communed at the pre-sanctified liturgy on Wednesday night. Okay? Uh, some people can do it. A lot of people can't. But I'm just throwing it out there um, so that we can know as well what we practice in the church. Um, or some people just have some water to keep them going uh, for the three days. Yeah, that's up to the individual again. Yes. Yeah. So after the after the vespers of forgiveness, um, I'm not sure what they do in monasteries if they start the fast after the vespers of forgiveness, but I think that they do. They start the strict fast, depending on on what time you want to go for go by. If you want to go with 24 hour time and look at until 12 o'clock midnight, just so you can sneak in, you know that that last ice cream. Um, before the fast starts, yeah. Um, depend. We we here follow the the twenty four hour time. So usually the way that we f um, follow it is from um, midnight is one day, the first day. Yeah. Olives, yes. O olives, yes. See, yes. Olives are allowed, if you're not having oil, there are some olives that have been prepared in oil, okay? Um, but there are, other, there, there are other olives that haven't been prepared with oil. Now, I hear this all the time. How come we can't have oil, but we can have olives, okay? Now, oil, as we know, is used as a dressing it's used to make food richer. It's used to fill our stomachs, whereas olives aren't. Okay? Even though oil comes from olives, um, with the fact that we're not using oil on our salads and all that, whatever, makes a big difference. And having a little olive there, just dry and bare, is very different to um, having yeah, all these flavoured things. So, yeah. But, the, but and, I'll, and I'll say something else as well. Although it might seem strange to people, don't always try to interpret things very logistically, very logically, I should, I don't, um, I should say, logically. We say, okay, you know, the, um, the, we can't have olives, uh, oil, but we can have olives. Remember the first rule of fasting. The first rule in fasting is obedience. So if the church is saying to us, you are allowed to have olives, but you are not allowed to have oil, then even though we know that it might not make sense 100% because oil comes from olives, 
The fact that we can be obedient to that shows that we've understood the meaning of fasting. Yeah. And the fact that we can be obedient also to the fact that, you know, for 40 days I'm not going to have meat because the church is telling me not to have meat, not to have eggs, not to have um, dairy. I'm going to show obedience to that. Because there's some people that say it's not what goes in your mouth, it's what comes out. Since when was it a, a sin? Why is it such a big sin to eat meat? It's not, it's a, it's not a sin to eat meat. Okay? But remember, we're here on a journey. And to begin with that journey, we the first thing that we do is be obedient. And the reason why obedience is the first rule on this journey is because we're trying to reverse something which happened from the very beginning in regards to fasting. Remember, God said to Adam and Eve, you can touch all the food from these, fruit, from these trees except for this one. And what did they do? They went to the one that they weren't allowed to. So they were disobedient. And so now the church taking us on this journey to return back to paradise is saying, let's reverse this. And from our disobedience become obedient. And if it was through gluttony that the first created fell and disobedience, then we're going to be exactly the opposite. We're going to be obedient and we're going to abstain from foods to show that we're not gluttonous and that we don't worship our bellies, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. With great difficulty. How do you convince people with medical t conditions that it's okay to commune and not to fast, for example, because they can't? Um, there are some people that accept it and understand that yes, they have a blessing from the church not to fast the way that everyone else is fasting. But let me tell you, there are some very, very difficult old ladies out there that whatever you say to them, they will fast if it means they drop dead there on the spot. Uh, and I know that from first hand, unfortunately. That's, and in a way, I actually, I, I really admire that. I really admire that. Um, I, I don't encourage it, but I admire it. I remember Kiria Ioana, God rest her soul. Um, one day she was, we were at the, sitting there at the elderly citizens and she was crying. And I said to her, Kiria Ioana, what's wrong? She goes, she was now in her 90s, I can't remember. And she said, I used to be able to fast from oil to commune, and now I can't fast from oil. And she was crying because she couldn't fast from oil. You know? I don't know. There's just that these people had this, this determination. Determination. And a few others, God bless them. That, you know. mm. 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 Yeah. 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 Oh, seafood. Um, yeah, so seafood. I, I always skip this one because I'm allergic to all those things. <laughs> it's not in my interest to care about that. So, But yeah, I think people have prawns and crabs and shellfish type of things. Yeah, ask someone that eats that type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> What are Yes, Kiriako. Mm. 
So basically, alcohol, we're allowed to have alcohol on the days that we're allowed to consume oil. Yeah. So wherever we see that you can have oil, usually it's, it's wine and oil permitted. When we, and when we say wine, we usually mean alcohol. Yeah. Yes. Why do we taste? Why do we fast from oil? Um, the reason why we fast from oil is because basically it really simplifies then our food. It makes it much more simple and ascetical. Yeah. Um, I was very blessed a few years back uh, to be at a monastery in um, during Lent um, a few years ago. And boy, that was an experience to see how monastics eat during Lent once a day. Um, and by that time, the once a day came, I was starved. So whatever was in front of me, I, I, I remember the apple, I ate it with its core. I was so hungry. And then I was eating, uh, I was watching the other monks eat and just this like plain salad leaves basically with nothing on it and I remember the one of the monks just taking some leaves and putting a little bit of salt on it and just eating those leaves you know and a bit of bread and I'm like God bless these people they're true warriors yeah spiritual warriors yeah yeah what else? let's pray O Christ, the true light who enlightens and sanctifies every human coming into this world, may the light of your countenance shine on us so that in it we may see the unapproachable light and guide our paths to the work of your commandments. By the intercessions of your all-spotless Mother and all your saints, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed evening.